Okay, so this is recording. I've intentionally put this without any of the Intellify branding on it because I actually want to record this and use this as a training video for within the Pi Data Sydney meetup. Um, and I want to be able to get a bit of reuse out of it. So even though I'm presenting this to Intellify as a lunch and learn, I want to be able to reuse this video in other places external to the company. So when asking questions, I guess be mindful of that. Like if there's stuff that we ask that's specific that's internal to Intellify, I'll just trim those bits out later um, before making like a public version of it. But I just wanted to give people context that I would like to use this recording in a context greater than just this audience at the moment. That way it saves me have to repeat myself. I can sort of that's why I like giving talks. It's like I have to say the thing once and I can just like share a link after that. Um, that works really well. Okay. So we're going to be talking about the mechanics of meetups and what qualifies me to talk about that. Because I've been involved in meetups for quite a while, and in particular in the Newcastle tech meetup scene. So this is the next two slides are going to be from a stewards meeting that we had uh, at the end of 2019. Um, we're talking about what's the Newcastle tech meetup ecosystem. So the coders group that started back in 2005 and like up until 2019, going for like 14 years strong. So they were like the, the backbone of the Newcastle tech community. But then you can almost see the meetups popping up in response to tech changes in the landscape. So it's like around 2014, we got IT and like InfraCodus, so that was all like the movement to cloud. Um, and then it's around 2016 that there was like a new JavaScript framework every three months. And it was around the 2016 Newcastle JS sort of timeframe that I started getting involved in meetups. And one of the organizers of the JS meetup said, hey, look, I need to step away from this. Are there any volunteers? I'm like, sure, how hard can it be? Well, I'm giving a talk about how hard it is. Uh, it's not that hard, but I just want to let people know it's a lot of little tasks, but this is where my journey started. I was working in North Sydney, but for a variety of personal reasons, I wanted to move back to Newcastle and just looking at the list of jobs on Seek, I was like, oh God, like I have to learn web development, but I was like an iOS developer at the time. I was like, I need to find out what's the actual layer land for jobs. So that's where I was like, all right, I'm going to go to meetups and talk to people and find out where are the actual jobs? And it's like, there's a hidden job market by going to meetups and talking to people. And you just don't see that on Indeed or Seek. So that's when I got involved. And I was with that for a couple of years. And that's when uh, around late 2018, start of 2019, I helped co-found the Hunter Data Analytics Meetup. And I was running that for a while and getting involved in that sort of space. So it's interesting how We've gone from cloud, uh, web apps, more data focus. Oh, wait, quickly, we need to secure that data. Um, so one of the other things, there's all these meetups going on, and something that I'm really proud of is I managed to get all those meetup organizers to actually be in the one Slack channel and actually talk to each other and collaborate. Um, so this was our, was our monthly schedule. Um, so it's like pick what night of the week and what week of the month you want, and it's like everyone was doing something monthly. So most nights of the month you will get free pizza and that's kind of cool um so this is the physical in-person events that were running but then we also had the in-between the online space so this was our newy 3ws because it was started by a bunch of web developers the newy slack so we had all these different other online spaces for between events that people could interact and build community so we also had the newy meetup organizers um, channel and there's like 30 of us um, trying to organize so many meetup groups. So we wound up as organizers being our own community. Um, so whenever an organizer was like, oh my God, a sponsor fell through or I need a new venue, we go to our community and help each other out and support each other. So that's a meta layer on top of the meetups. So yeah, we've got this online space of community as well as the physical space of community. So that's my background and how I've been involved in it. But then 2020 happened um, and we had to really rethink what is community and how we engage with each other. 
So I've been thinking about this for a very long time. I'm going to do a few coloured stick figures uh, to sort of represent the personas that I've been thinking about that represent how people interact with each other. So I'm going to have little purple stick figures for they're the community members. So that's anyone that attends or interacts with the spaces that we create. So whether it's physical spaces or digital spaces, these are a space that we create. Organizers, anyone that's involved in creating or maintaining the community. It's important to make sure that your community has clear guidelines of what is the code of conduct, what is acceptable behavior, and what behaviors does not belong in certain communities. And it's like, you do not belong. So it's up to the organizers to make sure that that safety is provided. Um, presenters, um, a lot of the times community groups, we rally around content. What are we, are we entertained by? What's that special interest that brings us together? So the, the presenters are, you know, people come to be entertained by content. So presentations, panels. Um, another way of looking at this, and part of the reason I want to do this talk is to sort of think of a broader picture of what is community. So there's a very specific heavy metal Viking themed band in Brisbane that I really like, and they've been doing online streams of the show. So music, music is the content, but the community that they've had rally around them. So like they've created an online community as a space in lieu of concerts, having that physical venue. So I thought that was an interesting idea of how can we look at what is community in that sort of idea. I made you some content. Um, sponsors. Anyone financially making events viable? So this is my bigger diagram of how I see physical spaces and also virtual spaces, how all the different personas are interacting. An event is usually centered around a person doing like some storytelling and giving a reason for people to come together. Um, really like meetup events are glorified like it's a games night or trying to have people over for dinner sort of thing for a barbecue. It's like the games night, that's the entertainment that people are focusing around. Uh, but then you've got the orange personas, the organizers, they're the hosts. But they also have um, a few different roles being organizers. And then the, your guests, your purple people, just, just shut up. I want to have a good time. Entertain me, please. Um, the thing that's changed from physical spaces to virtual spaces, you don't really have food and drink sponsors. All right, fine. Who can provide their own nourishment? But the space for a venue, previously a physical space, but sometimes you need to check, like, it's someone else is paying for Teams or someone else is paying for Zoom. Can we borrow that, please? Like, someone's paying for it, so they're sponsoring that virtual space. So for our last Pied Art of Sydney meetup, uh, we borrowed um, Intellify's Teams account. So thank you for sponsoring and facilitating that. Um, but then as an organiser, someone had to make sure and coordinate that, do we have access to these resources? So that's the role of an organiser. Also marketing, promotion, social media, pushing the event information out to make sure that people are aware, hey, the event's on, this time, location, all those details. That's a role as an organiser. Um, the host, the MC, the person that's sort of like directing the proceedings of the event and saying, hey, look, welcome. And then it's also, yep, yeah, time to go home, <laughs> end of event. Uh, it's an important role to give people cueing as to like what's going on. Also, the in physical and even virtual sort of spaces, you do need a person that's doing that technical setup and making sure that the presenter can just walk up there to their laptop, plug in, screen share, all their slides work at the right resolution or whatever. Um, do they have internet access? Like making sure that technically everything's going to be fine. That's on the organizer to make sure that that's going to be smooth and polished. In the virtual space, I'll get to that section in the live streaming section at the end. That, that becomes interesting. I'd like to give a demo at the end as to what that looks like, because I think that's kind of a new experience for a lot of people. Thankfully, Twitch streamers have done this for years before us and they've documented it thoroughly on YouTube. So there's many tutorials if you want to get deep into the weeds like I have been, and it's actually as easy as it's ever been, uh, which is kind of nice. So they're the personas and how I see them interacting. So this is one of those things where that we learn this as children. In the playground, you're looking at a group of people off and they're at play. 
and you want to join. And we make a lot of judgments and observations like, do I belong here? Like, do I feel like I will fit in? Will I be ostracized? Will I be an outcast? And it's like, we're making those judgments normally in a playground. We physically observe that. As an adult, trying to meet a bunch of strangers going to a meetup group, it's a much more sophisticated mechanism. In fact, not just meetup groups, like a company in Telephone. It is a community. So when I was looking at the job listing, I looked at everyone on LinkedIn as much as I could to see, do I belong here? Will I fit in? So there's a lot of things that we're talking about where it's like, it's just community, but it's like, this is why I was so excited when Granny came along, because it's like, this is like, we are a community ourselves. And like, how do we have that onboarding and welcoming experience to make sure people feel like I do belong here? Um, so how do we make that happen? Make people feel welcome, engage, and make sure that initial contact is warm and let people know we create space for them. So I've spent a fair bit of time listening to Culture Amps podcast, Culture First, and they talk about this concept of create space because uh, people can only feel like they belong when the space is created for them. So how do I actually implement that at the Hunter Data Analytics Meetup? I explicitly have a slide to call this out. Ask people, hey, look, is this your first time to this meetup? Put your hand up. And I give them a warm, wholehearted welcome. You're now one of us. Like the fact that you've had intention and you showed up, you're one of us. It does not matter what your skill level, prior experience, you are here. And I got that from Scott Hanselman, who is a advocate for Microsoft, and he does conferences a lot. And he gets a lot of people that no skill level, they might be doing a career transition, they want to get into development, and they're like, hey, Scott, I'm a bit nervous, I've got a bit of imposter syndrome, I don't know what the hell's going on, but I see that group of people over there and I want to be like them. And he's like, well, hey, you're here, welcome. You're now part of us. We all have to start a journey somewhere. You're in, you're part of the club. We're going to make sure that you succeed. And that's that initial onboarding experience that it's so important to make sure that people feel welcomed. And in particular, the second one, if it's like you've been to other meetups, you kind of get a feel for what they're like. If it's your first one ever, so stressful. Like meeting a whole bunch of random, like especially as adults, like if you're four, it's so much easier. I can just be like, hi, my name's Josh. What's your favorite dinosaur? One's a pterodactyl. Like apparently it's frowned upon as an adult, but anyway. Um, so make sure that they feel welcome. So with these two questions though, uh, being a data meetup, I do some cheeky statistics. This red line is the RSVP count per event. The orange is the amount of people that actually showed up. So we like to call that the pizza ratio for how many pizzas we should actually order because we know people have good intentions, but how many people actually show up? But then from those two questions, I'm able to find out of the people that showed up, it's about a third that are new people. So it's like, that's so important to me to know that this is their first experience and I need to be on this every time to make sure that they feel welcomed. And in particular, that green one, that's their first meetup ever. Make sure that they feel welcomed. So, meeting a bunch of strangers, really hard. Responsibility of the community, uh, all the people there to make sure that they get that initial sense of belonging, right, and done with warmth. Uh, see, someone's got the hand up, Pavan? Yeah, good question. You know, the previous slide, um, the, oh, sorry. The one that helps you decide yep. pizza. Yeah, so which meetup was this for again? This is for the Hunter Data Analytics meetup. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Thanks. Yeah, so I hear the Sydney meetup, so get like head counts like 200 people. We're pretty small fry sort of venue. Like we've had, um, I think our biggest event was this 37 head count. We had to have people on a waiting list and explicitly turn people away. And that's where it's like there's also a scaling issue. Do we try to get a bigger venue? And we intentionally said, no, we're going to cap it to this size because this is the size of community and environment that we want to create and nurture. Whereas like a bigger venue, that's not the spirit of this type of meetup that we wanted to be running for the Hunter data. It's more like a small scale rather than as a kind of a mini conference level once you get to like hundreds of people. So, story time. When initially running this meetup, I got it wrong. But I didn't realize it at the time um, until someone who wanted to come didn't. 
well, they sent me feedback saying, hey, look, here's all the reasons that why I did not come to your event. So like, holy crap, like most of the time, no one would ever send me feedback and I just never hear from them. So this is the that classic, um, you know that picture of the airplane where there's all the little red dots for like all the planes that came back with all the bullet holes, but you don't see the ones that didn't come back where it's like, oh, they're all the critical bits that you should be looking at. So this is where it's like one piece of feedback, I have to listen. So I was saying that I didn't think these are the problem. And this is probably going to reflect that, you know what, I'm a middle-aged, cisgender, male from privilege. Like, I wouldn't think of these things as being a problem until it's highlighted. So university campus, I wanted to be engaged with students so they can come from class. Totally fine. It's a familiar space for them. But it was in the engineering building, deep in bushland. It was at night, so it was like 6.30, I think we were kicking it off, so it was pretty dark. Uh, it was a long walk from the nearest car park, low pedestrian traffic, poor lighting. And this person said, look, I looked at the RSVP list and it was just all dudes. In fact, all the organisers were dudes as well. And it's like, oh. But then it's like, was there any food at the time of night? Am I going to do, like, do I need to have dinner beforehand or not? Like, is there any consideration dietary requirements? Like, there's a whole lot of things that are just turning me off. And it's like, oh, my God, how was I supposed to know that? But now I'm listening. And this is why I'm trying to share that as well, to think about, it's like, what are the things that can silently be excluding people from feeling welcome, making them feel like I don't belong? So these first orange ones, made them feel like it was high risk of being attacked or assaulted outside the venue. It's like, again, outside of my experience, but I thoroughly listen and note these things now. Um, the red one, it was very homogenous, a very specific type of demographic, which was being portrayed um, outwardly, rather than a diverse mixture of people that it's attended events. Like, oh, I don't want to be the first woman there, or I don't want to be like the first like non-white person there. It's like, uh, it's going to be, bit of an icky situation. I don't want to be the first one there, so I don't feel like I belong just by looking at that outward um, digital footprint. And yeah, it can be quite exclusionary as to like food and drink. And even if events have alcohol, uh, that can be an exclusionary thing. It's like, oh, meeting a bunch of strangers and there's alcohol. Yeah, I don't feel safe. Um, and I've even heard some people like, you know what, I just, I'm a, I'm a teetotaler. I, I I don't drink at all. And it's like, I just don't feel comfortable in that sort of environment. So it's like, can we just have like non-alcoholic events? Like, that'd be kind of nice. So it's like, I've taken a lot of that feedback on as other people give me more feedback. But it's one of those things where it's like, didn't think about it until someone told me. So that's why I'm sharing that. So do I belong here? How did I make it right? We moved it to our CBD campus for the university up here in Newcastle. Um, Plenty of well -lit pedestrian traffic areas, car park nearby is free after five o'clock. We moved it to an earlier starting time to 5.30. It's so still a bit of daylight, but we made sure we finished by 7.30 because that was one of the comments that, hey, can we try to wrap it up so I can get home and put the kids to bed by eight? Okay, cool. I mean, I don't have kids, so I wouldn't be aware of that, but it's like I need to take that feedback on so I can make an inclusive community. Uh, make the itinerary clear so that that 5.30 to 6.15, that's the unstructured like networking time. Some people really thrive on that. Some people hate it. And they're like, I'm going to sit in my car until 6.15 and then show up for the presentation. I don't want to talk to people. I'm just here for the presentation. Totally fine. But they only know that if we put the itinerary up there. So they're like, it's clear what they're getting themselves into. Um, also trying to get from work to these events like can be kind of stressful with traffic, running late. It's like, let people know that first bit, that's the unstructured time. If you're running late, it's fine. Like, no stress. Get there whenever you get there. You've got plenty of time from 5 o'clock to that 6.15. Like, if you're within a reasonable travel radius to get to the event, perfect. Um, we made the dietary requirements and catering obvious. So when you RSVP, you say, hey, look, I'd like a gluten-free or vegan or vegetarian. And when we put the pizza order in, we just make that happen. Um, and the last one, a more diverse leadership team. So this was a really big deal. So I mentioned that back in 2019, I got the 30 organizers of the different meetups together. And one of our goals was to try and have a more diverse members show up to events. And it's like, how the hell do we do that? So I actually went back through six meetups, all the events that were hosted in 2019, and essentially did like a heterogeneity score. How much were Caucasian males a dominating group of hosts and speakers? Um, so there was that one group, IXDA, 
didn't really mention them too much at the start, but they're a design UI user experience sort of a meetup group. All female organizers and two thirds of the speakers were female. So it's like, whereas every other group with male organizers barely had 10%, more often than not, it was like zero female speakers for an entire year. They had the opposite problem. So my hypothesis uh, that I tried to test thereafter is like, you know what, if we have diverse leadership, diverse speakers, that's an image that we are presenting that it's like, you know what, if the leadership team's diverse, then it's like, well, we might have diverse members actually feel, yeah, I belong there because I can see someone like, like me up there. Fantastic, I belong. So that's my hypothesis that I've been trying to test out for a while. And the last in-person meetup that we did before the current lockdowns, um, because we had female organizers, I, I think this is a causal sort of thing. I can't prove it. But the first eight people to show up, eight, were all women. We barely got any women to show up to events at all before. And it's like the first eight, I think that goes to show how punctual they are too. Um, but yeah, that was a huge turnaround from where we were back in early 2019, where it's like, look, we're scaring everyone off. And so this is the importance for me to listen and create space. And also part of the reason why I'm trying to get this talk is like, I need to step down as an organizer so I can create that space for others that don't look like me to step up. Uh, and that's part of the reason I want to try and facilitate and give tools and sort of dispel like what is actually involved. It's not that hard, but it's like, this is the thing that's really important to me to create that space for other people. So do I belong here? The take home message. Uh, before we get into the event management thing, do we have any questions sort of so I can have a drink? Okay, I'll clock on through. And um, just feel free to put your hand up and I'll pause in the middle of it or just unmute yourself. So trying to run events, um, whether they're physical or virtual, if we want to try and do them monthly, well, we've only got 12 times in a year. But from experience, no one actually wants to show up to January or December. Scratch them out. So that means at most we're doing 10 events in a year. Okay. But with the part out of Sydney, it's like, we're just starting. We don't want to have so many events that we exhaust our talent pool of presenters. So let's have a lower cadence of presentation. So this is what we're doing. So we had Arch present in August, and then we have Icarus present in October. And that gives me a bit of time between things to actually like rest, recover. Um, but also we're not consuming our presenters too quickly. As we get a backlog of presenters saying, hey, look, we want to be involved in this, then yeah, we can up the cadence. Or if it's like dying off, we can reduce the cadence. This is a thing that we can play with. Taking a while to actually load the next slide. Cool. So to make that happen, we need our group of organizers to actually make that happen. So we also need to collaborate and coordinate. So we've created a PyDart of Sydney Slack group and this little private channel where it's like, that's our group chat we can coordinate and it's like, this needs to be outside of Intellify. We need more organizers than just Intellify because that's also, I think, a diversity thing. We don't want it to be PyData Sydney is the Intellify show. We need try to invite people from outside Intellify to bring their experiences to actually run this meetup. So that's the group chat. How do we stay in touch with each other? But then also using Google Drive. So this is like how internally we're using Teams as our group chat but then we're using SharePoint to store our documents. Similar sort of thing. We'll have in any community group, you need to sort of like organize your workflows of how do we communicate like ephemerally, that group chat, um, storing like long-term documents. So if I leave, I can have like a temporal relationship communicating with the next organizer that comes after me through these documents. And this is actually a document that started at Newcastle JS. So I've been collecting it and then copy and pasting it to the next meta group and the next meta group. So this is quite mature by the time we had the Hunter Data Analytics meta group. And I've just copied most of this across to have the same sort of like, what are these learnings that we can build over time? And pretty grateful that the I've stepped back from the Hunter Data Analytics meetup and there's eight organizers. So they rotate and have like three people um, of that eight. Um, each meetup, trying to like, do the key roles to make sure it runs each month. Cool. 
So to run the events, this is a very interesting chart. After an event, I can download the RSVP list and what were the dates that someone said, yes, I'm going to come. I removed everyone that was an organizer. I removed everyone that eventually declined. So of the people that do eventually say, yes, I'm going and do finally come, normalized it because some of those events there's like 20, some were like 37. So of 100% of the people that do wind up coming, I think these key trigger points, the 14 days and like three in one day, might have something to do with meetup.com's event signaling, saying, hey, would you like to come to this event? They've got automated marketing for those impressions. But I think also like a month out, two months out, I'm not sure if I can attend. I have a lot of uncertainty as to whether I can attend an event. But it seems like around that two week mark, people are like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be available. But then there's a whole group of people that was like three days out. It's like, I only have certainty like in the next three days. There is one exception though. This event over here on the left, that 28 days out, there's a whole bunch of people that are like, yep, I'm definitely coming to that. Which funnily enough was, it was Kale's talk. Popular. So this kind of leads me to what's the timeline before an event of what things need to happen, like leading up to day zero. So funnily enough, um, yesterday represents three weeks out from the next event. So Icarus provided the information that I need for the next event. So at the end of this, I'm actually going to, like, people can drop off if they don't want to see like the nitty gritty details of me creating the event, but I'll have that as at the end of the recording and I'm gonna actually create the event for the October event. So that initial phase of trying to line up a speaker, to be honest, is the hardest. Trying to get someone to say, yes, I would do public speaking. That, that's everyone's fear. Uh, but it's like, please stand up and we wanna hear your voice. I think this kind of feeds into some of like the thought leadership program, like how do we have platforms to help people find their voice? This is where I was like, I'm trying to help facilitate at least the Pied Art of Sydney Meetup to have a platform where people can find their voice. Um, so yeah, lining up speakers. So we're going to publish the event to meetup.com. I mean, you could use some other platform, Eventbrite, whatever, but they've got their own automated marketing campaign where it's like, if I'm interested in all events for this group, I'll automatically get notifications. What we also need to do, this is only a recent feature in YouTube, you can schedule a video to go live. So you've got this placeholder. Um, where people will see, oh, this event's coming out, cool, and I get notifications through the YouTube platform. So we've got two options now to get notifications. We also created a social media account on LinkedIn for PyData Sydney um, and on Twitter. And this is the ways that we feel like our audience, they're the platforms that they're on where they're trying to look for this content. So this is where we're going to sort of like feed the algorithm, put those events out there. But we can only do that once we have the details, and to be honest, the details at this point is what's the talk title, what's two sentences about the talk, and what's two sentences about the speaker, and a promo photo. Once we've got that, that's enough to do that little call to action link saying, hey, I'm going to register my intent that I would like to RSVP. We push these out on LinkedIn, Twitter. This is where these dotted lines, you might notice when you see something on LinkedIn, Often it was posted seven days ago. So there's a, quite a lot of lag on how the algorithm decides to filter what is like trending right now versus like, what am I interested in? So that's why I think 21 days out, that 14 day mark is probably when they're gonna be seeing that impression for the first time. Then we share it again at 14 days out and they'll probably see that one at seven days out. And then we do a third time. So we try to have three impressions. Um, and if they're on multiple platforms, they're gonna have like up to six impressions as well as the meetup. Things like, yeah, you know what? I really do wanna to go to that event. So hopefully they've had multiple impressions. It's like, you know, you really might be interested in going to this event. And they're like, yeah, you know what? I will. Whereas if it's like competing attention, you're like, you see it once, it might fall off. There's multiple impressions what really help people out. Yeah, I'm gonna to commit to that. <laughs> cool. That's all I've got for here. And then I'm gonna go into the live streaming setups. Do we have any questions about that at the moment that I wanna go back over? Uh, 
I just want to say that this is like a meetup talk within a meetup talk. It's a bit meta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's pretty awesome. The best bit about running a data meetup is it's the best audience to cheekily do surveys on them. They're like, yes, it's numbers about ourselves. So, and then you present the charts back to them about themselves. It's like they like looking at their own line chart mirror of themselves. Um, perfect audience for it. Cool. So I'll move on to the next section just to try to be mindful of time. So this is where 2020 onwards becomes very interesting. Uh, everything kind of had we just assumed events were on site. And in fact, a lot of the stuff that I've learned on how to do this wasn't just like gaming, like Twitch streamers. A lot of people trying to get their church to run events online, um, teaching, schools, trying to get events online. In fact, my partner, there's a gym that she goes to. They're suddenly learning everything about how to like run classes online um, and how to do all these streaming setups. So there's a lot where the whole ecosystem of like, how do we have community and relationships has shifted. So when Arch and I did this last session, uh, this was quite hokey, but it was the poor man's implementation to get it working. Um, so the way I kind of envision the community interaction is through the live chat. Because I've seen other events where we had, it's a Zoom thing or Teams or whatever, and it's like, a lot of people can just like cut in across or they're not muting their mic and it's like, oh my God, the quality control. And I didn't know how many people were going to be jumping onto like Pied Out of Sydney. It's like, it's an existing brand. Like we could want it with like thousands of people and I didn't want to have to like have like 30 or 40 people with their mics unmuted. It's like, just go down this route. That way they can interact live. It was like an eight second delay. Uh, so I had Arch give the presentation, but also had his phone open to keep an eye on the live chat. And I was doing the same too. So that way, if anyone was like breaching code of conduct, uh, I can just like report, mute them, block them or whatever. So, hey, look, out straight away. Um, but the thing that makes this a bit sketchy is, well, it made it easy for Arch because it's like, hey, look, it's just a Teams call like this. Share your screen, have a chat to me. I'll handle the rest. But the key thing that could have gone wrong is like it had to go through my laptop. So if my internet died, the whole thing's dead. Uh, then use OBS Studio to fuse and coordinate the streams because I needed to have Anja's audio and my audio. So if I'm talking to him, he can hear me, but then my audio needs to also be fed back out. So this is where it's like, I used to be the light and sound guy for the musicals in high school. So I was like fully into like, all right, this goes there and plug this into that. So it's like, this is like, it's, it's all coming back to me now, just in a more, a more professional sort of setting. So OBS Studio is free software. It, it's quite um, fully featured and there's plenty of tutorials on YouTube on how to get it working. Going forward, I think this is gonna be a better setup using browser-based. Um, so Melon is by the same company that creates OBS, but this is a paid offering. In fact, all the browser-based offerings are paid. They have a free tier, but it's like to get that 1080p like crisp output, you need to pay for it. So I trialed StreamYard and Melon, and Melon just happened to be, well, it's from OBS and they had a 50% off sale. So I was like, all right, I'll just chuck some money at that and then we're good for the next 12 months. But the way this works is you don't need to install any software. So for the October meetup, I'll start a session and I'll send the link to ICRA and just need to enable webcam and microphone. And from that, you can share a screen. As the host, be able to control like whose video is on the screen, whose screen is being shared at any given time, and it's just all browser-based software. Amazing. And I think this is where a lot of applications going, like that desktop application isn't really needed as much anymore, especially when the browser can act as a thin client. But that fusing of video streams this is why you need to pay for it because Mellon has their own computers in the cloud that's doing that fusing. And I think they're running OBS on the cloud to do that fuse and then send it on to YouTube. So this way, if I have internet issues, it's purely up to does Icra still have a solid internet connection and you can keep presenting. That removes moving pieces and it makes it a simpler story. 
end, the live chat from YouTube comes straight back into the Melon app. So you can see what you're a preview of what you're presenting and have the live chat coming up on the side. Again, this simplifies it for us. And I think this is going to be a better solution for meetup groups going forward. Um, that's another point that I was going to make with this. It'll come back to me. Oh, so outputting to just YouTube. But if we want to, you can add Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitch, I think even Twitter. Any platform that has like a live streaming thing, they've got like a, a protocol where you can just do like that single sign on authentication. It gets its token and like, yep, cool, I'm good to stream to these platforms. It sends the audio video out to all platforms. And if they have a live chat, it feeds that back in and blends them all together into a singular live chat feed. Kind of cool. So when I was last doing on site setups, uh, this is where I'm actually currently using. Um, little lapel mic. The difference between a like a webcam mic or like these sorts of headphones, they're sampling the audio at like eight kilohertz, whereas a better microphone um, or like the podcasting microphones, they're sampling at like 16 kilohertz or 24 kilohertz, much better quality sound. It's like that podcast level quality. So just it's like a $50 microphone for the lapel mic. It makes a huge difference to the quality of audio. So this little green thing is a game capture card. So the idea is you take an input video source and it splits it off to two parts. So one of them's got a pass through and they can send it off to another computer. The idea is like if I'm playing like a console game, I want to have a live video going through it to my TV so I can play it, but I could have another computer recording or streaming what I'm doing. In a similar way, as a presenter in a physical space, I can walk up with my laptop, I plug into this box, that box passes through to the projector. So the people in the audience still get that same experience. But we've tapped off a version of that video to another computer where we can use OBS Studio. Uh, haven't got it here, but we would ideally have a camera on the presenter, the lapel mic feeding that audio stream in, fusing them together so we can have no lag or jitter between like the what is the person saying? What's their screen saying? And the mic, it's just little tweaks like that where it's the quality of making the presentation uh, without that jitter or lag. Fusing that together in OBS Studio, free software. But it's like these things, uh, I think all up cost me about 700 bucks to get it all. I was like, that's it, very minimal, very portable for an on-site event. So for a capital expense, that's pretty low, but then you've got a lot of benefit ongoing. So I'm not saying this for just the Pi Data Meetup. I'm saying if you have other meetup groups where you want to get this running, I think that's a minimal upfront cost instead of having like recurring costs with these browser-based software. Um, just trying to present some options here on how we can get this like mixed experience. And I think where this really helps is you have two experiences now. It's extending it beyond just a single room where it's like one and done. We have the recording can live on so people that can't attend live they can watch it later they can also see the replay of the live chat of what was going on you can have this online experience and one of the other bits of feedback that i had more had new people showing up once we started doing live streams not even yeah doing live streams because we had people that you know what i've got kids i'm trying to make dinner i i just mute my microphone and i can listen in i can participate but it's like I could still be a parent where like I'm needed within seconds to attend to a situation, but I can still be involved in the community. And it's like, cool, I feel like that's an important thing moving forward that we need to learn that physical events, we can also, there's a whole community that were excluded, but we can include them now because the technology is here. So the version where we just use like a browser-based solution, it's like, well, the presenter, they just open up a tab and like this presentation that I'm doing now, I could do a screen share of that. The stream goes out. And then I've also got the projector just plugged in as a second monitor. So it's like less equipment, less moving parts. But the cost is we're renting someone else's. So rather than having like, here's the extra laptop, we're renting someone's cloud. So that's the other cost. So I think it's like 450 full price for a year for one of these sort of services to get like the top tier. 
So if you're looking at running your own meta group, this is sort of like the price range where it's like a sponsor would really help. And sponsorship is a really tricky and icky situation because they're paying for something. It's a transaction. They want something in return. The problem I found with running meetups is I've, I just wanted to meet friends, someone to talk to me about dashboards. That's what I really wanted uh, because my wife didn't want to hear about them, funnily enough. So trying to create this interest group, I've collected a heap of technical specialists and recruiters love that. So they really want to sponsor things and be involved and like, oh, hey, you've just done our work to like bring a pool of talent together. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, can I talk to them? Like, no, no, no. I need to protect the community as well. You can provide the pizza. We'll give you an impression for your brand, but still, you can't cold call these people. They need to choose to talk to you. You can have that brand impression. Sure, that, that helps you. It's that repeated messaging for every event, but please don't just be those like crappy LinkedIn uh, recruiters that just like, uh, was it spray and pray? <laughs> no, please don't do that here, not here. Um, so it's been very interesting trying to keep recruiters at arm's length that want to overly sponsor things. Um, so that's been an interesting fight to sort of make sure that agendas don't get blurred. Um, yes, recruiter is a giant novelty check. It's like, excellent, done the work for you. One of the other things I've recently learned about um, in networking, there's a thing called a barbell graph where it's like you've got a highly connected group here, highly connected group here, and there's like a couple of nodes in the middle. Those nodes in the middle, because it kind of forms a barbell, have what's called a high between this connectivity because the shortest path to any other node, a lot of those shortest paths go through that single node in the middle. Being an organizer, I've accidentally found out I was in the middle of an information marketplace where I'd have members come up to me and say, hey, do you know where I can find work? But I also have employers saying, hey, do you know anyone that can find work? And it's like, oh my God, I'm ahead of the game with that word of mouth job market. And it's like, this is the best place to be if I'm trying to job hunting, just be an organizer for a while. And so I know both sides of that marketplace. Um, so that was an interesting learning. Cool. That's all I've got before I actually go into the particulars of if anyone wants to stay online and watch me actually set up a YouTube live stream and I'll share out the link so you can sort of be on our little fake live stream at the end of this, but I realize that we're getting short on time as well. So my takeaway message is to build community, you need to ask yourself, what are we presenting for do I belong here? And create that space. Cool. So I've got questions. I just got one question, Rahul here. Um, Josh, how, long, how much time, personal time, do you invest in actually running one of these meetups? More than I should. Uh, realistically, probably should be about four to six hours total over a month. Um, and that's where it's like, I think if I divvy up the uh, posting stuff on LinkedIn, Twitter to someone else, it's like I could probably halve that. Uh, the amount of time it takes to uh, create the event, the meetup and the YouTube thing, uh, that's probably like an hour in itself. Um, just trying to like, Trying to do the image and then like just playing around in Photoshop to get it like that splash image looking nice. I mean, I could probably do that in 15 minutes, but then it's like I'm trying to prevent a certain present a certain level of professionalism too, because again, PyData is an existing brand, so I feel like I have to live up to that level of expectation. So I want to get that level of polish just right. Um, marketing, uh, actually running the event, being the host, uh, that takes a bit of time because there's the time before the event, during. And then after the event, I need to make sure that what happens on the YouTube recording afterwards, how polished is that? Um, so what I can show you. Uh, so I use Chrome profiles. So I've got, there's my personal profile, there's my Intellify profile. So all the bookmarks are different between the two. Uh, and then there's the Pi Data Sydney, which is linked to the actual YouTube account. So it's like, I need to be very careful about what I do whilst I'm in this version. So for example, Archer's View Analytics, Details. After the event, I went and put all these timestamps in. 
So that way, if we go to here, da, 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 pause. Simply by having those timestamps and text in there, it creates these little chapter marks. Little things like that, little details of polish of what I need to do after the event as well. So it's like the actual event is probably about three hours, like the bit before, after, and during. Um, but that's where it's like someone being the host, they're there for an hour. But someone doing the production work, they can do the hour before and after um, as well. And this is where it's like having as many volunteers as possible, we can share that load. Awesome. So if anyone wants to drop off, that's totally fine. But if you want to see me actually create Icarus event for next month, stay on. We can go through that and just feel free to just jump in and ask questions as I'm chipping away doing that. So this is currently in like a draft mode, so it exists. You're able to see that people could see it in the events, but it's not announced. Once you hit announce, that's when that automated messaging kicks off. So let's go organizer tools. Let's go edit this event. Cool. And for these online events, we've picked 4.30 in particular because it's like, oh, it's the end of the day. People might be like, depending what time they knock off work, they might be like, all right, I'm commuting, or it's like, I can just put this in another tab and listen to it, especially in this sort of like lockdown sort of times that seem like the best sort of like sweet spot to sort of like catch people where it's like, they might not be too busy um, at that like shoulder of the day. Okay, let's go and change this photo, move photo. Let's go upload a photo. Hi, data. let's go splash, open. Perfect. So the photo. That should upload. Perfect. Um, this is another thing that I did where I had like a Google form. So while we've got all these placeholder of here are the events coming up, if people are like, oh, I want to go to another PyData event, but it's like, oh, no one's actually there. These placeholder events are doing the work for me where it's like if someone wants to say, hey, look, I'd like to talk, this Google form, someone types it in, I'll get an email notification that someone's had the intent to talk and then we can start having that conversation. Do, 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 do. And then just letting people know what the event contingency is for if we are out of lockdown, we can have on-site events, but in the meantime, while there are lockdowns, it'll be online only. And again, explain to people what happens in online events, telling people how they can connect to us in the in-between to get to the PyData site, and just letting people know that, you know, there is a code of conduct. Cool. So that link just goes to the YouTube channel at the moment. I'm going to just leave that as is for now. Cool. Uh, that's it. Let's go save changes and announce. Ta-da, that's it. Cool. Now what we can do, so let's go to the Melon app. Cool, let's go invite a guest. Let's have a play. Copy link. Drop that in the chat. So this is roughly what an event could look like. Uh, got all the PyData branding around it. Let me go share a screen. Screen, understand. Let's go Chrome tab. Um, let's do that one. Share. Cool, sharing that. Excellent. Let's show it on the stream. So, what's happening over here? 
Oh, hi, Pav. Let's show him on the stream. Cool. So this is how we can like choose different layouts. And let me hide that. Cool. Now this is like a bit of more of like a panel format, so we can have a discussion. But as you can see, over on the left is our waiting area. Let's just mute Pav. Don't want to hear his audio. Oh. Nah, let's hear him. Oh no. Yeah, it's working. I can hear. So let's not do that. So I haven't actually gone live yet. This is the preview sort of area. Um, so if I do want to go live, we can do just a recording. Uh, but this is linked to the PyData YouTube account. So going live, I'm going to make it unlisted. No one else will be able to see that link. Cool. Let's go next. Oh, yeah, actually select it. Yep. So it's unlisted. Cool. Test stream. Uh, category. Education. Sure. Go live. Uh, testing. Go live. Fantastic. So share stream, copy stream link. Let's chuck that in there. So you should be able to go to YouTube and check out that live stream now. So only people with that link can see that. And this is how we would do like the technical run through just to make sure that slide decks work. And why is that not playing? There we go. Cool. So there's going to be a bit of a lag on that. I'm going to close that because that's going to be weird. And if I show chat, so anyone that goes to that live stream and wants to start talking on live chat, that'll come through over on the side here. So this is what a browser-based sort of solution to organize the presentation will look like. Hey, quick question. So, it, yeah. so the, the YouTube one is turned off? I think. So if you go to YouTube, all right, so everyone watches through here. And oh, okay. Yeah, I guess my question is like, is the YouTube chat and the, the Melon app chat all synced up? Uh, message from Melon. So, hello, send. Oh, yeah. great. Okay, cool. And that way, if I also want to talk to like other panelists or the presenter, I can go to the private version, where it's like only the people on this melon Ooh, I can hear myself. Right, let's get rid of that. Cool. Yeah, end that live stream. End stream. That'll kill that off. And then to do that forward planning one, I'll do that after this. Um, essentially, what I'll do is go schedule, add a schedule broadcast. Um, it will be a public one, um, streaming info. And this is where I can go put, uh, it will be a live stream. Next. And this is where I can like upload thumbnails and the talk description and those sorts of things. So I'll do that after this to make sure I do it properly. Um, but yeah, that's it in a nutshell to go and set up the YouTube event. I'll go and grab that link, chuck it back in the meetup event. We're good to go then. And then once I've got the meetup event, um, which is back here, LinkedIn. Um, under here, if you're added to the company page for Part Out of Sydney, I'll jump into that. Then as that persona, then I can share the links and talk. 
similar thing, we'll log into Twitter as the PyData Sydney persona and go and share that marketing information. That's it. That's what's involved in running a meetup at the level that I've been trying to sort of push, but I would love to people to come in and do a much better job than me. Um, have your own spin, have your own flavor, because the thing that's actually concerning me is I'm based in Newcastle and it's PyData Sydney. There's a geographic constraint with that. I won't be able to keep organizing this after the lockdown's end. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'll follow that up after this. Any other questions or we're right on time, so I'll wrap it up there. No questions or anything, but that's a whole lot of work that you do every couple of months, so that's awesome. Thanks. Hope you guys got a lot out of that. And if you do have any questions, please, I'm a nerd about this sort of stuff, so I'd love to have a chat. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, bye. Thanks. Thank you.